Grady Nutt had a love for everyone, and everyone who met Grady Nutt couldn't help but love him. When you met Grady, you always walked away with a gift, and that gift was usually a smile combined with a laugh. This collection of stories you're about to hear was Grady's own project idea, and these stories are some of his personal favorites. As we all listened and laughed during the recording session, we would never have suspected that this would be Grady's last recording, but what a joy to have shared the moment with this special human being. He certainly gave us a laugh and a half that night. Grady Nutt. I see a very big distinction between humor and comedy. I think humor is the fun we notice, comedy is the fun we invent. To me, the funniest things are the things that really occurred. This really occurred in the East Dallas Baptist Church in Dallas in the early 50s. Minister of Education there, I will just call Brother Randall. Brother Randall was one of these people who spoke with authority and clarity and diction at all times. And he was leading the congregation through the ministry of announcements one Sunday morning. That's when we read to you the announcements printed in the bulletin. And he was reading like the parking lot paving committee will meet Sunday afternoon at 4.30, bring a sack supper. <clears throat> Things of this nature. Well, he's up reading the announcements to the church. It's about, uh, oh, 10 or 15 minutes after 11, and a charter member of the church by the name of Granny Brown has come to church late. At least she has arrived at the sanctuary late. Now, there's some evidence to indicate that she's been back in the ladies' parlor. That's what we call it since we brought it indoors. <laughs> Used to be an educational building out in the back. Actually, wasn't meant for group work. It was a little kind of a meditation chamber. And it qualified as educational space because it's where we stored old literature. But anyway, she has come into church late, and she's been in the ladies' powder room, okay? And he, she comes into the sanctuary. Now, Granny Brown is a woman in her early 80s. And she walks just a little bit bent over, has on one of those little black straw pillbox hats with a big pearl head pin stabbed through what we hope is hair. <laughs> if it didn't, she is a tougher bird than we think. She may be 143. And she's wearing a black dress, and she's got her gloves in her hand, and she's got those Cuban lace-up dress heels on, clumping along, walking in the church. And she has a big armful of study Bible type deal with 17 generations between the Testaments. She's got all this Sunday school and missionary literature stacked up. She's got tracts that she picked up last summer at the Greyhound Bus Depot when her sister went back to Idaho <laughs> out of a track rack. And she's got all this in her arms, a couple of these tracts on the top, bright red flames, why the Catholics may not make it, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> And she's got all this in her arms, and she's coming into church. Now, Randall is up announcing the parking lot paving committee, bring a sack supper kind of stuff in the announcement period. Now, Granny Brown is coming down the aisle. She's been a charter member of this church for over 50 years, and she's speaking to everybody down each side of the aisle that she ever taught or has known. So here she comes, waddling and toddling, and she's saying, Morning, Sally Sue, morning, Jimmy John, and she's speaking to people, and she doesn't hear well. And so she doesn't know much of what's going on. Well, she gets down to row three. And just as she gets there, she's going to start stepping over people to get right out in the middle because row three is where they have hearing aids on handles. <laughs> and so Granny Brown is heading for a hearing aid, stepping over folks. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. And Randall, as she starts across, announces the offertory hymn. Let us turn to number 257, sing first, second, last. Everybody stand. Now, in a Baptist church, when you say, everybody stand, that means get your knees bent and your book open. Nobody will stand in a Baptist church till somebody up front sticks their hands up and says, let's do it. <laughs> so everybody's sitting here watching Randall, ready to get up when he gives the signal. Got their books open to 257, they're going to sing first, second, and last. <laughs> Granny Brown is stepping across. Now, I said there's some evidence to indicate that she'd been in the powder room. What it was was a roll of tissue. And as she gathered up all this Bible and quarterlies and stuff, she got a roll of this stuff right up in the crook of her arm and didn't know it. And she's stepping over all these people. And just as she gets to her seat, Randall, without a word, sticks his arms up and the whole church hits the deck. Now, she's hard of hearing and hadn't heard the announcement. When I all stood up, she turned sideways to see what's going on. When she did that, the roll of tissue fell out. The loose end caught up in her arms. 
the thing hits the floor and goes dip, 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 just rolled out. Now Randall is standing up here with his arms in the air. Here comes a roll of toilet paper right out from under the front row. Hits the offering table, bloop, and just lies there. Randall's kind of startled. It's the first thing to come forward in this church in over two years. <laughs> and he's up here just, what is this? <laughs> About that time, Granny Brown saw the thing hit the floor and realized what had happened, but didn't know where it had gone. <laughs> Quickly puts her Bible and stuff down and starts trying to reel in the loose end. <laughs> now, this is the kind of paper that churches buy cheap. You can get a box of 100 rolls for 37 cents. You got to know karate to tear this stuff. <laughs> yeah, cut it off. And this won't break, and she's reeling it in. And it's just blah, 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 coming off the roll down here, and Randall is watching it disappear. <laughs> and with all, he forgot to put his arms down. Here he stands, and he looks up on row three, and here's Granny Brown with a giant white paper backlash wadded up in her arms. What are you going to do with a roll off the roll? When Randall saw all of that, he just collapsed laughing. Ah! <laughs> then the choir saw it. You don't ever want the choir to see anything weird. <laughs> Strangest people in your church will always be in the choir. We know this. That's why we put them up there, so we can keep an eye on them. <laughs> Dress them alike. Anything breaks loose, grab somebody wearing a robe. It's a group effort. <clears throat> And the choir saw it. They're holding each other up. Ah, see. And Granny Brown hadn't got to the hearing aid yet, so she doesn't realize they're laughing. About that time, the organist finished the inter introduction, and they start singing, When the roll is called, if yonder I'll be there. They had to carry Randall out of church. I was only pastor of one church. It was called the Graffenburg Baptist Church, Route 2, Wadi, Kentucky. As far as we know, there was no Route 1. <laughs> Graffenburg was a wonderful church, and I went out there to be pastor the third year of my seminary experience at Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville. And uh, a group of men from the church came to move Eleanor and me and our two sons, Perry and Toby, from Seminary Village, which is sort of... God's warning to you for what will happen if you don't follow him obediently. You may live in parsonages like this the rest of your ministry. In fact, if it hadn't been for termites holding hands, we would have had no walls. <laughs> Place was held together with thick paint and prayer. That was it. Moved from Seminary Village out to Graffenburg, Route 2 Wadi, and they took us out there, moved our furniture in a cattle truck that had not been hosed out. Almost had to sell our sofa. It was just terrible. In fact, we had the only, <laughs> only living room in the country that smelled like the dairy barn. It was just awful. Well, anyway, they were moving us into the parsonage, and the men were out toting furniture and hauling boxes and moving lamps and all this. And I'm just right in there with them working. About 15 of us had all gathered together to move the preacher and his family into the little parsonage at Graffenburg. It was kind of a old makeshift looking place. They built it during the depression for $450 with used lumber. We had cracks in the floor you could throw a cat through. I mean, it was just strange. But we're moving us into the parsonage. Had a senior deacon in the church named Clark Dawson. Clark was a former auctioneer that weighed about 345 in his prime. Had to retire a number of years before because he'd been gored by a bull in the auction ring or something. <laughs> and um, so he had retired and he had a walking cane, and he would stand and, and, and uh, share with you, give instructions to you, give his opinions on things, and Clark had one on everything. Well, I knew about Clark, and uh, we had heard about each other a bit from a former pastor, so I had a good attitude already. He's a wonderful, fun man. <laughs> and he was standing out here leaning on his walking cane while we're hauling furniture inside. And as I was going by him once with the other end of a big chair or something like that, Clark said, Preacher, I hope you're going to be with us a while. So I kind of jabbed at him a little, and I said, well, Clark, with your help, I can probably make it. <laughs> and he grinned, and he said, well, I tell you, we had, uh, had one preacher out here, Brother Grady, that uh, moved around from one church to the other, and so often that every time a pickup truck drove up in his driveway, 
every chicken he had, ran out and laid down in the yard and crossed his legs to get tied up for the trip. <laughs> Baptists are notorious for a lot of things, preaching, uh, some of our evangelistic services and things like that when we try to put high pressure on you for low living. All parts of the service have always fascinated me. I love even the, the welcome to the visitors. I love the offering. <laughs> I love everything about it. It's just fun to do. But one of the things we've always done in Baptist Church is we call the invitation service. That's at the end of the preaching when we sing these songs like, Just as I am and have thine own way, Lord. And uh, almost persuaded. Now, if that won't almost persuade you... <laughs> You basically got a statue heart. That's what it is. Sing old sad songs, deathbeds are coming, and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Trying to scare something out of you so you'll go on to heaven. It's that kind of deal. Basically, if you're doing it, give it up, quit it. And come down here and share it with us so I'll know I hadn't been pouring all this down the tube. Well, the invitation service is frequently treated like a threat. My father could do that about as good as any preacher you ever saw. He could just act like he knew who did it. And that just scares the church right into looking at the hymn book. They, I've seen them sing 95 verses of Just As I Am and never look up. Just, just as won't look up. That means you did it. See, I mean, don't look up. And Dad would walk back and forth like a panther in the cage at the city zoo. He knew who did it. Well, he would just go on and on and on. I remember one Sunday, it was, I was about 15 or 16 years old, and it was about 10 after 1. And Dad had really been bringing the pressure on. Ah, you know. And uh, we were down to about 95 or 6 verses of Just As I Am, and I was afraid he was going to start on Almost Persuaded, and I did not want to go to the mission field. Uh, that day, I might have volunteered just to go home for lunch. You know, that was, I might have done it. Well, it was about 10 after 1. Mother put her arm around my shoulder, and she said, Great, Lee. <laughs> I said, What? And uh, she said, would you please go forward and rededicate your life to God? The roast is burning. <laughs> so I did. I stepped out in the aisle, and Dad was kind of shocked, you know. Uh, you hate to go an hour and ten minutes and then find out it was your kid that did it. See? And he looked up as I came down the aisle, sort of like, no, 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 no. And I'm saying, well, yes, 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 yes. And I just kept coming. Well, he took me by the hand and 310 pounds and kind of beat on my back. This was why a lot of people kneel in the altar, get the breath beat out of them by the preachers. <laughs> Pulled me in close and leaned over and said, what is it, Great Lee? <laughs> I said, the roast is burning. <laughs> so he called for prayer for an unspoken concern. <laughs> and uh, it really embarrassed me because... Uh, no telling what they thought I had done, see that? I really think he should have just said, the roast is burning, let us pray. <laughs> I have an unusual name, Grady Nut. That really is my name. Uh, you have to learn to get along with that, because when people meet you, they never say, pleased to meet you, they always go, <laughs> So I've had to endure some chuckling and giggling and poking and all that kind of stuff. I tease about the fact that I grew up at the Nut House and now run one. But it really was a fun name. So consequently, I've always listened to unusual names. The most unusual name I've ever heard belongs to a minister in the North American Christian Convention. Now, this is a group somewhere between the Disciples of Christ on the left and the Church of Christ on the right. And if you know anything about those two groups, you know that between them there is room. <laughs> See, the Church of Christ does not believe in playing the organ or the piano in the church. In fact, they have metal detectors at the doors. <laughs> they'll check, just be sure you don't sneak in a harmonica or something. So they, they'll do you this. So those people are not going to have it in the church. They don't even often blow a pitch pipe and give you a true F sharp, you know. They just let you hurt yourself hunting for it. <laughs> you see, they don't believe in this stuff. Now, the disciples of Christ, they play anything you can roll in plug up. They don't care. They'll wham, dang, bam, let's go, you know. Between them is the North American Christian Convention. They do play the organ and the piano, <laughs> but they're nervous. <laughs> Their organist keeps her tennis shoes tied at all times. <laughs> One of the ministers in this group served churches in Alabama, Indiana, 
uh, Iowa, and last I heard of him, he was in Michigan, except recently he did perform a wedding in North Carolina, and somebody sent me a clipping from the Charlotte newspaper with his name circled in red, knowing that I love fun names. Well, I'd been telling about this man for years. Now, he has, I think, the worst name you could hope to have. I really believe this. It's, it's wonderful. His last name is O-D-O-R, Odor. <laughs> now, I thought for a long time it was O-D-E-R. I tried to help him out all I could. See, we put another T on nut for the sake of the family. And I thought they could at least put an E in odor for his sake. But that's not true. I met his brother and his nephew, and it's O-D-O-R, odor. We're talking, you know, <coughs> you know, odor, like downwind from something you don't like. It's that kind of deal. Now, if your last name was Odor and your first name was Marvin, you'd still be in trouble, see, because people are going to hear Odor and go, <laughs> you, you've had it. It's hard to get respect when you've got a name like Odor. And that would be bad enough, but his first name makes it even worse. I-V-A-N, Ivan Odor. <laughs> I'm not making that up. That's exactly true. Now, you think about this. He's a minister, and his denomination calls the minister brother. Okay? Now, you just get this all in one pile of putty and think with me. What if you came up and just introduced yourself and said, Brother, I have an odor. And what if the other guy said, Brother, you really do. <laughs> Preachers get a reputation sometimes for being long-winded, and they earn it in every instance. I heard a great line the other day that you should not speak unless what you have to say is more important than silence. <laughs> Most of us haven't learned that in the Baptist church. We'll talk till we think of something to say. <laughs> I've seen preachers that preach with a finger in the Bible just in case they get to the text. <laughs> I had a letter from a pastor up in Pikeville, Kentucky. I, I, from the handwriting, I judged that he was one of our senior adults, probably retired. It was kind of squiggly and leaning in one direction. And it was a wonderful letter in which he shared with me a story from his childhood. They had a pastor in their church who was exceptionally long-winded. And he just went on and on and on. And people are just, huh, could not believe how long he was preaching. Well, about six weeks into his work as the pastor of this church, just getting way on out there into the afternoon, and this is before pro football, so you know that the people weren't giving him too much grief, but it was getting kind of nervous time. I mean, when you know the Methodist halfway through lunch, it is it's tough to sit there and listen to somebody preach on and on and on. So this pastor just kept preaching, 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 and so the letter I received from this older minister said that one of the men in their church who's kind of a, uh, a restless, don't take any nonsense, speak your mind kind of character gets up hat in hand and starts stomping right up the middle aisle, leaving the church. And the pastor, in order to exert authority in this situation, stops right in the middle of a big point and says, Brother Johnson, <laughs> he turned around and said, Yeah, Reverend. He says, Where do you think you're going? He said, Reverend, I'm going to get a haircut. And the preacher says, well, why in the world didn't you get a haircut before church? He said, for church, I didn't need a haircut. <laughs> One of the fun things about being a minister is you get to sit up front and look at people. And people do strange things in church. Many of them I can share with you. But I think I've seen every known technique for sleeping in church. There are some fine ways to sleep through what you just don't care to listen to. One fellow reminds me, I've seen these people for years, but this technique is essentially the technique that you see in that little yellow-headed bird with the red nose that leans over and drinks out of a glass of water at a cheap truck stop. You know, down and back and down and back. Looks like one of these oil pumps out in West Texas. Now this fellow sits and looks right at you, and you're just preaching your heart out. And he just starts going forward. Do -do -ba -do -ba -do -ba -do. And then all of a sudden pops back up and stares at you real wide eyed. <laughs> you romp on two, three more verses, and he's right back down again. And then comes right back up. Want you to think that he lost a cuff link and he's hunting for it and had to come up to refocus. 
Then you got a guy that looks like a big tree being worked on by a slow beaver. <laughs> and ever so slowly, like the hour hand on a clock with a bad battery, starts tipping to the right. Just puffing it out. Weakening. Uh-huh. So painful. Hard to hang in there. And finally, boom, right in the wall. Now, I love that. Then you got a fellow that's in his late 60s. You've got to be on Social Security to develop the patience for this technique. And that's the ability to sleep through an entire message with both, always, both eyes wide open. No blinking. Sound asleep. You look like an owl at noon, you know. Some of these guys can't blink till Tuesday afternoon. I mean, wide eyed. Then you got a fellow that works at the local hardware, and it's fall, clean up, paint up, caulk up, plastic up, get it warm time. This fellow works down at the hardware and spends half his day running up and down one of those little four-rung aluminum ladders, getting things out of teeny boxes off the top shelves. Comes home every night with his varicoses throbbing like dinger cords on the service station driveway, just bang, oh, hurting. Got on those service station dress shoes with white socks, rolled down around the ankles, and his legs are killing it. About 6'2, 245 pounds, comes in at night and drinks him a cold Coca Cola, watches one of America's fine television programs, <laughs> falls into bed and dies. <laughs> He's gone. Next morning at 8 30, his dear wife, Lucinda, rolls him out of bed to go to God's house. Now, he does not want to go to God's house. <laughs> His attitude is, if God wanted me at the house of prayer, he wouldn't have invented the NFL. <laughs> he wants to rest. But she gets him to go anyway. You know the type of woman. She's only about five feet tall, but she, she's built like a fire plug, wearing pantyhose. Tough little woman. <laughs> Salt and pepper gray hair looks like she jumped off the building and sprayed it on the way down. You know? <laughs> Tough. Drives a Buick Electra. You've seen them. She goes by and all you see is hair and gloves. Mm. Got her an electric seat for school crossings. She comes up in your room. She goes down. Now she's sitting with him in church on Sunday morning. And you're up in the choir, let's say, looking out at them. And her face looks like sweet hour of prayer. Inside, she is the battle hymn of the Republic. <laughs> and he's sitting over here listening to Port, just trying so hard to go to sleep. Now, she keeps her arm against him because any time he takes pressure off, she knows he's dying. <laughs> and the minute he leans off that way, whom, she lets him have it with an elbow. Now, you're sitting in the choir watching this. And her face is sweet, air prayer, and he comes, I'm going to kill you, woman, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> And she's going, you sleep again, Marvin, and I'll bash your ribs. And it's just, if you can sit in the choir and watch that and not laugh, I'll buy your lunch. <laughs> My favorite technique, and the one I personally use for sleeping in church, involves the use of a hymn book. Not paperback if you're on route to. You got to have a hardback hymnal for this. Stand it up long ways in your lap and lay your arm across the top, your left arm. Then put your right elbow on your wristwatch. Now put your chin in your right palm and go to sleep. You cannot fall over. <laughs> and from the pulpit, it looks like you're just staying in there with your pastor <laughs> as he preaches out his heart. You're meditating away. Preachers use different techniques for determining the length of their messages. <clears throat> Most of them don't like you to see them look at their wristwatches. You know this. So they devise wonderful techniques. One minister wraps his wristwatch around his palm and has the watch inside. And every now and then he'll talk about the holy city and glance at his watch. Uh, it, the ones who keep them on usually wear them with the wristwatch on the inside of the wrist so that they can talk about over and over and over. And as they gesture that way, kind of like waves of grain at you, they can glance at the watch. That's a technique. Another one, they'll have a pocket watch kind of laid out on the pulpit, but some of them get fired up on stewardship or backsliding or something like that and have been known to just crunch a watch. I don't like to do that. 
occasionally the pastor will, like an uh, old drugstore going out of business, will buy the Dr. Pepper clock with 10, 2, and 4 on it and hang it on the front of the choir, I mean the, the balcony rail. That way he can see it, but nobody else can except the choir. And there you have to kind of, it's six and one half dozen the other. The choir's tough enough to keep interested without letting them know how much longer you got to go. So you have to kind of weigh the, the, the possibilities. Now, I think the best technique I ever heard, I've just put a cough drop in my mouth. The best technique I have ever heard uh, for this, a minister discovered quite by accident one day that a butterscotch lifesaver held between the cheek and gum and not sucked on. If you just allow it to go the way of all butterscotch, <laughs> will last 22 and a half minutes. So just as he would get up to preach every Sunday, he would <clears throat> clear his throat, clunk one in, put it over between his cheek and gum, and get up and just fire one, fire two, and let you have it. When the cough drop ran out, he quit. Or the butterscotch, he stopped. Well, the congregation was absolutely mystified. All of a sudden, this fellow that had been running past 12 o'clock was letting them out at three minutes till, and they were in front of the Methodist at the cafeteria every Sunday. <laughs> Many of you know how hard it is to beat the Methodist to lunch. <laughs> I think sometimes they have church at the cafeteria. That's my honest opinion. Well, anyhow, this preacher started getting quite a reputation, not because he was a good preacher, but because he quit before 12. Why we don't learn that, I don't know. You could get bigger crowds if you just let them go. No matter what you said, they'll show up if you let them out. Well, anyway, crowds just are getting there throng and almost having to have two services. They're getting so many people. And the folks are actually taking odds on him down in the men's Bible class. Three will get you one, you know, they'll bet on what time he's going to let us out today. Of course, all the proceeds went to the building fund, so it was kind of Christian gambling in a sense. <laughs> well, it was just incredible. People coming just clocking him with stopwatches. The place was just a buzz in a Twitter because he was letting them out on time. One Sunday, he was letting them have it, and he began to notice people in the church kind of nodding and rubbing their eyes, and then they're pointing toward the Holy Land and checking their watches. One older couple sitting over to his far right, your left, <laughs> got out with hats and coats and got down low and started trying to sneak out. Nobody is more obvious in church than somebody trying to be inconspicuous. <laughs> so they go crouching and sneaking, and he was kind of puzzled by that. Finally, back at the back, through those little square windows and those flapping doors that let the church in and out, a lady from the nursery on tiptoes peeked through. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Now... A preacher has to be careful. When the nursery gets down on you, those little dudes could come in with us. <laughs> and we want to be sensitive to God's leadership in this area. So, <laughs> he makes a gesture toward the Holy Land and glanced at his watch and it was ten after one. And he double-checked and by mistake he'd gotten a button in his mouth. <laughs> you do want to watch that stuff. I got all these. What is this trailer? Water. Water. Thank you. <laughs> Bill Trailer, my water person. <sighs> now, see, the Methodists could hold a revival with this. I mean, they could. <laughs> I mean, the Methodists could have done Pentecost with that much. <laughs> Just hit a little here. You don't got some on you. You're in next, on you? <laughs> the word baptized means put them under till they bubble. Am I right? John the Baptist did not stand in the River Jordan and throw it out on people. <laughs> and they didn't call him John the Sprinkler either. Let's, let's be honest. I was in here one time and had a Methodist group was with us for an album. And one of the ministers in the Methodist church later told me that we had a sprinkling of Methodists here that evening. I thought that was probably most appropriate. Uh, I did most of my early preaching in little tiny country churches. These were Route 4 Sardis Baptist Church, Midlothian Baptist Church. I, I don't believe we had a Laodicea. They didn't name one for that place. But we had almost every other kind. You could Lone Oak, New Hope. Mother called those No Hope. <laughs> <laughs> All of them had snaggletooth pianos, pot-bellied stoves, turkeys nested in there during the week. And the first churches I preached in were those kind of churches, 24 or 5 in Sunday school, depending on whether or not flu had got to this route. <laughs> and you go out and just preach your heart out. Here you are, 19 years old, 17 years old, trying to straighten out the lives of these rural people. 
and they're just biting hard on the bottom lip, trying not to laugh at you. <laughs> and you feel so serious, and they're thinking, he's so much to learn. <laughs> then you go home for Sunday lunch. Now, that was my favorite part of the little country church, was going home for Sunday lunch. These people could flat do Sunday lunch. The table in the kitchen was bow-legged with Sunday lunch. You'd have four kinds of meat, 19 different kinds of fresh vegetables, beets that were hot, cold, cubed, sliced, dashed, everything. Beets, every way you can do beets were beaded. They were done. <laughs> then you'd have about uh, eight or nine different kinds of relishes and chow-chow. You had every known color of green pickles. <laughs> then they'd have breads. Hot rolls, cold rolls, light bread, heavy bread, corn bread that the South could have won the Civil War with. I really believe this. <laughs> Throwing it at the North or feeding it to the North. Either way. Break off a chunk and defend your county. <laughs> iced tea. Now, we're talking serious iced tea here. Dark, sweet, rich, heavy duty, <laughs> 40 weight. Iced tea. Sunlight cannot penetrate this tea. It'll run up the glass and go around. It just cannot handle this kind of tea. Throw a slice of lemon in there and you can hear it whimper. <laughs> Nothing that sour should have to die. That's sweet of death. For dessert, we have got chocolate meringue pie. Maybe one of my favorite all-time desserts. And this farm has hens that God has called to meringue. <laughs> and they have surrendered to it. They're laying eggs without yolks in them. <laughs> Committed to meringue. You've got to take a rack out of the oven to toast the top. Looks like nine dirty brown Dairy Queen cones up on the top. Those little curly peaks, little pebbles of honey looking around. They got nine inches of meringue on top of one inch of chocolate filling. Chocolate is your reward for wading through meringue. <laughs> I loved it when they'd have all day singing at dinner on the ground down at the little country church. That was one of my favorite things, down Route 6, you know. You're standing on the front porch under a shade elm, and here they coming from every direction, boiling up that gray gravel on the road, firing rocks at mailboxes and heifer calves, <laughs> sailing in. And you could spot every single car coming that had a meringue pie. Easy. <laughs> what they do, they top the last hill and cut off the keys and just coast in the parking lot. So these people <laughs> know you run in and hit your brakes, your meringue will slide off in the floorboard. They just know that. <laughs> I have a wonderful friend named John Carlton who is a seminary professor at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary and also teaches at Duke Divinity School at Duke University. John grew up in Texas, and uh, in his church where he grew up, there was a wonderful lady who had never married. She was in her early 80s when John was in his mid-50s. He went back for a visit for a while to visit with his family and some friends and had had a wonderful Sunday afternoon to sit down and visit with this lady who had led him in Sunday school and all kinds of wonderful church activities when he was a child. And she'd been such a wonderful kind of older aunt type character for all the young people in the church and just made her life looking after them. Well, he thought she was just so wonderful. Spent the afternoon talking with her. She said, John, he said, yes, I ain't so-and-so. She said, I, I think you ought to know that I have planned my funeral service. Oh. And she said, yes. She said, I've lined up the music I want sung. I've lined up who I want to preach it. I've lined up everything about it, what I want done at every single stage. And she says, I've even already picked my pallbearers. And John said, well, ain't whatever her name was, I <laughs> I think that's wonderful. And she said, and John, all my pallbearers are going to be women. <laughs> and John said, women? I never heard of that. And with a twinkle, she said, John, the men didn't carry me out when I'm living. They sure not carrying me out when I die. <laughs> <clears throat> President of Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas, uh, is Russell Dilday. Dr. Russell Dilday. He's been a good friend of mine for 20, 25 years. And I have verified this story with him, and it's absolutely true. It is so funny. He was pastor of the Tallowood Baptist Church in Houston at one time. And one Sunday morning, sitting in his office, there was a knock at his door. His 
pastor's study. That Russell has a wonderful sense of humor and loves to tease with a straight face and just kind of catch people off guard. And he opened the door, and here were two little girls about seven or eight years old standing there in their Sunday ruffles and patent leather shoes and little purses and gloves and just all bright-eyed and everything. And he opened the door, and there they stood. Well, good morning, ladies. Morning, Dr. Dilday. What can I do for you? And one of the little girls says, Dr. Dilday, we found a dollar, and we don't know what to do with it. Well, Dilday, with this wonderful, witty sense of humor, looks at these two little bright-eyed girls in church, you know. He says, you found a dollar. Mm-hmm. He said, well, now let's see. Was it, uh, was it green? Yeah, they looked at each other. Sure, yeah, it was, it was green. Did it have a big one on it? Mm-hmm, yeah. Did it have a picture of George Washington? Yeah, it did. It had a picture. George. He said, well, that's my dollar. You found my dollar. And one of these little girls said, Dr. Del Day, in the ladies' bathroom... <laughs> I think it was last summer in July, I had to speak for a community worship service in Jasper County, Illinois. The community is Newton, Illinois, and uh, it was the scene of the county fair. Jasper County was having a, a community worship service, and all the different churches were coming together. We were meeting in the bleachers at the trotting track, where horses come through like the Hamiltonian and trot front feet first, and pull these guys on little bicycles that are shaped funny. <clears throat> And uh, I'm at the county fair grounds to lead in this community worship service. And we got several hundred people. In fact, the whole county was almost there, except for the folks running my motel. And here they are all up in the bleachers, and we kind of weighed out on the muddy, slick track. It had been raining and got up on a flatbed truck. And the choir sang, How Great Thou Art, sitting in front of me in folding chairs toward the audience, and then turned around to face me. So I get up to speak and just had a wonderful time. The only problem was we were downwind from the pig barn. <laughs> and the pigs had arrived also. <laughs> now, pig is bad enough when things are dry. When it gets wet, pig hangs heavy in the air. <laughs> Except for bacon and pork chops, I just assumed Noah had left them off the ark. <laughs> I'm serious, really. I think, I think Noah wasn't thinking when he brought pigs and chiggers with him. <laughs> uh, Boy, he could have saved us a lot of grief if, if he'd left those off. But anyway, here I am downwind from the pig bar, and everything was over, and I got through, and I waded back across the mud over to the chain link gate, and I'm standing here meeting people as they come out of the bleachers. A lady walked up to me. I introduced myself to her, and she to me, and I said, Where are you from? She said, Oblong. O-B-L-O-N-G, just like Oblong. In fact, actually, Oblong. And I said, Oblong, and she said, Yes. I said, there really is a place called Oblong? She said, yes, yeah, just across the county line, about 18 miles over here on Highway 37 or whatever. And I looked on the map the next morning. Sure enough, there was Oblong. And I said, well, I never heard of Oblong, Illinois. She said, well, that's where I'm from. She said, did you know we also have a normal Illinois? I said, yeah, and I know about normal. Illinois State University is there. I'd spoken on the campus two or three different times. I know about normal. She said, well, about two and a half years ago, a man from Normal married a lady from Oblong. And our little weekly county paper over here carried a headline on the society page. And it said, Normal man marries Oblong woman. <laughs> well, I tried to have fun with her, see, thinking I could out-cute this lady. Don't mess with these kind of women. <laughs> and I said, well, listen... <laughs> Do y'all have a square over there in Oblong? She said, honey, I married him. <laughs> I just love that. Over the years, Grady brought a lot of laughter to a lot of people. All of us who experienced his gift of contagious laughter came away with hearts lifted and lives enriched. If Grady were here, he'd say to us, keep a smile on your face and a song in your heart. How thankful we are for Grady Nutt and his special gift, laughter. His stories were worth a laugh and a half. <laughs>